welcome to the Connect interviews. My name is Areti Daravimu. I'm the editor of Smart Energy International and content director of Endlit Europe. And I would like to welcome to the stage Mr. Chris Peters, CEO of the Elia Group. Hey. Hi, Chris. Chris, it is difficult to have uh, invited a CEO of your, let's say, level and not go directly to the Green Deal and the situations that we, we are facing in Europe right now. So given the many difficulties in the last year, the war in Ukraine, the energy prices uh, and many other things, unfortunately, how confident are you that we are going to meet the energy targets set by the EU Commission and do you think that Repower EU is enough to get us there? Um, I, I would say today there are two ways of looking at it. There is one, let's say, which is, well, actually we started already before the Ukraine war with something that sounds quite impossible to achieve. Mm. Yeah, so in the sense that we saw at that moment of time, if you looked at the increased targets, the projects were not in the pipeline. And if you looked at the permitting time, we said, like, it's not going to be delivered before uh, 2030, when I look for the fit, fit for 55 targets that we had. Then you had Repower Europe, we increased the targets further, but I have to say with that increased ambition we see as well that there's a higher political will now to make, make things happen. For instance, in our um, um, uh, company in Germany, 50 Hertz, we see today that permitting processes are smoother than they were before. They're not yet where they should be, but we have made great progress. We see as well that the urge now to, ma to, to, to make progress in Belgium, you see Ventilus uh, is, is now taking steps forward. You see that at the political level, they understand that if they want to achieve that, something needs to happen. It's not enough to just announce targets, you also have to make them happen in practice. Second thing which is good is that we see that industry now starts to accelerate and mm. starts to drive the energy transition together with us. Before it was a little bit that they said, please solve it to us, deliver us carbon capture, deliver us cheap hydrogen and we will do. And now you see that they say we'll become active investor into that. We want to have PPAs, we want to get networks to be developed so that the energy get to us. We uh, take stakes into uh, carbon capture, we take stakes into wind farms. So you see that now industry is really accelerating as well. So that makes me positive that we actually are capable to make it happen because the situation in the war has actually created a situation where it's like we have these long-term targets which seem to be a little bit little inspiring for many people so like it's so far out but with something which is short term and which now creates the urge to say like we need to get rid of this russian gas and what is the best way to do that accelerate the energy transition so for the first time we are seeing the political will and the will of the industry coming together, yes, right? Yes, yeah. indeed. That's what we see. It, that's what we see when we talk with both sides. And so it, it, it will remain a challenge because, of course, what we do is scaling up with a factor three, five, depending on where you are in the infrastructure side. So it is an important scale up that you do. But there's a high willingness to make it happen, and that's good. So if we see that, we think that many things will happen in the coming years. So that. Uh, we see it moving fo forward faster than we saw in the past. So the ELIA group is mainly a TSO group. ELIA in Belgium, 50 Hertz in Germany. What, uh, what are those two TSOs are doing specifically to reach the targets by 2030? Well, most important is that we reinforce the backbone of our grid in both countries. And that backbone is quite important because it does two things. It allows you to integrate more renewables and it allows to electrify both households and industry. Because if we want to meet the targets, the first thing that you have to do is electrify. And so electrify is on mobility, on heat, yeah, both if you look at the household side, but also at the industrial side. And therefore, of course, you will see an increase in demand and that needs to be supported by a strong grid. Second thing what we do is, of course, what we see, there's a lot of NIMBY in the two areas that we serve. So renewable energy coming from offshore becomes more important. So we start to develop offshore grids before we just connected wind farms. Now we build islands, uh, we have hybrid interconnectors, we make much more complex structure at sea to facilitate that integration of offshore wind into the grid. 
it is lovely that you mentioned uh, renewable uh, energy sources and integration because this takes me directly to my next uh, question, which is how affordable is it? I mean, it's good to say, and it makes sense to say that renewable energy sources are the most important tool and their integration, of course, the most important tool to reach our goals. However, is it affordable? Is it feasible? Actually, what we see is it's the, the, the best way forward and industry starts now to say the same thing. So far, a lot of people were in the feeling like renewable energy needs to be subsidized. It's expensive. Today, what we see is many industrials tell us like the PPAs that we have uh, 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 underwritten a few years ago were at that moment of time a market price that we pay to be green. Today, it's the cheapest part of our portfolio, and it's a stable part. So if we could have that price for the full portfolio, would, we would sign off tomorrow. Give us access to those PPAs, give us access to renewable energy, because that will anchor industry in Europe. So it is not only a question of, is it affordable? The question is, can we afford not to go there, because we might lose welfare by industry saying, I don't invest in Europe anymore. Europe is energy short. And we are dependent on fossil fuels. If we replace that with renewable energy, that becomes a cheaper solution for us than the fossil fuel dependence that we have today. So it's really an important element that we, that we drive the energy transition through because it's not only a question of climate change, it's also a question of welfare anchoring industry in Europe. So it is affordable. This is crystal clear. What I'm still not, let's say, convinced is how feasible it is, especially if I think of storage capacity in Europe and storage technologies. Um, I'm much more optimistic to that. So we did last year a study. Each year uh, we do a big study looking at understanding better how the grid of the future needs to function. And last year we did that on uh, how does a, gr a, a, a grid that is fully uh, driven by renewable energy, how would that work? Can it function? The question was not, is that what we want to do? It's a question like, is it feasible at all? And so, of course, that's a lot about flexibility management at that moment of time. And we looked at flexibilities in different time zones. So we looked at short-term flexibility, day-night, eh, solar flexibility that you have. We looked at the three days to two weeks, yeah? wind typically, wind cycle. We looked at seasonality, yeah? more demand in winter than in summer, maybe also less sun production in winter than in summer. So how do you manage that? And we looked at those cold spells, yeah? those periods where you have for a, a prolonged period of time insufficient production of renewable energy in a large geographical zone. So we looked at all of them. And so what we saw is the very short term, you can easily solve with the flexibility that is now by electrification coming into the grid. So it is the batteries in your car that you use with, the, with its flexibility, is the heat pump that you will use, and the same at the industrial side. If you look at the one that is in the medium term cycle, you can solve that by the grid. Interconnections will make sure that sun or wind is somewhere shining and you bring that to the demand center that is in need at that point of time. So that is solved there. The, 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 the seasonal cycle you can solve by having the right balance between wind and sun. So you need to be overbalanced in wind, not a problem of today, something that you can do later on because today you need to go all out and on every renewable that you have, but later on you should probably overbalance a little bit on wind, which will be a challenge of course because wind has more higher complexity to be delivered than, than, than solar PV on roofs. And then the last one, the, 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 the one on the cold spell, there you need backup capacity, but there we say it's not an urgent problem. It's a problem mm -hmm. that we need to solve 2040 plus. Today we can solve it with the remaining flexible capacity that is in the system, so the fossil fuel plants that we still have. When we start to fully phase them out, we have to see what do we do with that capacity. Will it replaced by clean energy like hydrogen that we put in CHPs or that we put in in, 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 in CCGTs? Will it be those small nuclear entities? Will it be a new um, uh, type of storage? Will it be carbon capture on fossil fuel plants? 
beforehand. So you will have different technologies that have to compete, but it's not an urgent problem, we say, because we can manage the grid today, so we don't have that problem. And the amount of CO2 emission on those very short periods of cold spell that only happen now and then is not that high, that it's the most most strict problem. So we need actually to have the overall system to be much more clear over the whole year cycle. And then we can actually take those problems one by one. Yeah, that's clear, clear. And it also gives us a little bit of time. That's uh, good to know. I would like to move to, to another topic. And I admit it is a topic that I really wanted to ask you about. It is about consumer centricity. Now, Elia, 50 Hertz, their TSOs, they, uh, they give um, high voltage uh, electricity. Why is the Elia group so interested in consumer centricity in, in the citizen? And you have a whole approach for that. It's, it, it is impressive. So can you please explain to me why? Yes, because succeeding in the energy transition is about integrating more renewables or integrating more carbon-free electrons. So even if you say we have some part which is nuclear, you will integrate more and more non-flexible electrons coming into the system. Ones are intermittent, the other ones are base load with relatively f limited flexibility. And so you have to manage that flexibility with flexibility at the demand side. Mm -hmm. If we want to reduce the cost of the system overall, the more flexibility that can participate, the better for us. And so as a responsible for balancing, we actually want to make all the flexibility that is in the system, that comes into the system, f um, uh, liquid and make them participate. So remove all those barriers that they can participate to the system. And of course, what is the best way to make that happen? If you have customer-centric solutions where people say, I'm willing to do so, yeah? We, for instance, have a partnership with Octopus in, in the UK. They do many of these things with consumers where they say, how can we incentivize them to remove the load at the peak moment? What can we do to have their car charging somewhere over the whole period that we have so that we can do it at the moment that we have most renewables on the system? Those kind of solutions, them focused on the full, let's say, consumer-facing side, us as TSOs focusing on making that system behind work, that is the kind of partnerships we will have to see more and more to make sure that that is going to happen so that they liquefy all this flexibility and that instead of build, building dedicated capacity that we just can use what is available on car batteries, on heat pumps and use that into the system to make sure that it's always balanced. Building on this, it also needs, uh, the system needs also to be safe, both from attacks, hacker, hacker attacks, for example, and resilient. Uh, so how can we achieve zero accidents? Well, you say two different things. So mm. we have one thing that we call security, one thing that we call safety. Yeah? Yeah. The security side is something where we work together with different government entities, the army, state security, etc. cetera. Um, uh, we have offices around cybersecurity because on the one hand, of course, we protect our own systems terms uh, cyber attacks, but a lot of things can happen actually outside of the fence for us. Yeah, people could actually, whatever, switch off 100,000 cars in their, lo in their load, load pattern and that could, could create shocks. And we have to make sure as well that we protect ourselves for cyber attacks on appliances that mm -hmm. might have an impact. And that's something that we cannot do, that we only can do in collaboration with government entities that are equipped to do so. So that's one thing that we do. On the other side, of course, Critical assets, we try to protect them, uh, most of it against terrorist attacks. What we see these days in Ukraine, of course, goes beyond that. Yeah, You see then, of course, that if people start to have targeted attacks with uh, uh, rockets, with uh, drones, etc., I think any system that is so spread geographically will be vulnerable over time, not in the short term, that's what we see in Ukraine, but if you have a continuous <laughs> flow of attacks, I think that it will be difficult because at some point of time, there are no transformers anymore in the market that you can use to replace the destroyed one. So that is really something that we have to start thinking about. What would it mean if that would happen to a larger scale than just Ukraine? Ukraine now, a lot of TSOs like us give support and send our transformers to them. But there is a limit to how many you can replace because you don't have so many spare parts standing actually somewhere in the system. So that is something that really is a concern that mm -hmm. we have to have. The other side that you just said is safety, but safety is a very different thing. Safety is about how do you make sure that your own people, your contractors, 
or third parties that get somewhere in contact with your installation are protected well. And that is really about what is your strategy? Is safety included in everything you do in the execution of your strategy? Do you have the right culture? Have you trained your people? Do you have the processes? Do they have the tools? So how do you make sure that that's central? And I try to basically make that so. We have a slogan in, in, in ILIA, which is called We Go For Zero, as you just said. And the Go For Zero, we basically say, is safe if safety is the question, it's the only question that you have. Mm -hmm make sure you're always safe. At the moment, you hesitate about safety because you got your brief in the morning, that's what you're going to do, and then you say, hey, there's a discrepancy to what I understood we were going to do and what I see, stop. Yeah, we're not in a hurry. Your life and your safety is much more important than anything else. That's what we want to have as an overall culture into the company to make sure that that's going to happen. And the same what we see is, it's always interesting to see, like, is the culture working? We had a couple of our employees that stopped building sites who were not ILIA building sites. That basically said, like, stop, this is not safe, you should not do it this way. So that's always good when you see that your people start to apply it even outside of their, their own work situation and start to, let's say, help other people to become more safe. Chris, thank you very much for this very, very interesting uh, conversation. And uh, it is really good to know that uh, for the Elia group, it's safety first. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us. Please don't forget that you can watch this interview and many more at the enlit.world.